This is the image that often comes to mind at the phrase nuclear reaction. After all, it is an ancient instinct that commits a perceived threat so strongly to memory, and we have witnessed time and again the destructive power from which there is often no means of escape. Such inherent bias has given rise to a common misconception, and in this episode, we'll go beyond the environmental effects of both nuclear fusion and fission reactions, and explore how their processes are as deeply rooted in nature as the aversion to them is in our minds. Welcome back to Project Dark Wolf. A deadly radioactive cloud rises over seven miles. Our ships are tangled wrecks. The juxtaposition of otherworldly beauty and hideous power of a nuclear detonation is almost an artwork in its own right. In much the same way as an oil slick evolves colours on the surface of water, the expansion of the iconic Flamogenitus, otherwise known as a pyrocumulus or mushroom cloud, produces a graceful shifting structure, opening as a rosebud does to an intricate flower, capturing the eye and demanding the viewer's respect. And it has every right to do so, for many reasons. But let's begin with the most obvious. This landscape depicts a shoreline typical of the 29 small coral atolls that exist within the Central Pacific's Marshall Island chain. Their remote location has given rise to 46 endemic species of flora and fauna, a large number of which are endangered. These form part of a diverse marine ecosystem, which is today closely monitored. Unfortunately for the inhabitants of these small and isolated landmasses, the same geographic situation made them a prime site for studying the effects of at first atomic and later hydrogen bombs. Quickly becoming known as the Pacific Proving Grounds, the area was subjected to 67 nuclear tests between 1946 and 1958, One, five. culminating with a series of thermonuclear detonations, which included the infamous Castle Bravo, the largest and the most damaging that the islands were subjected to. The initial tests of atomic bombs, which rely on the splitting of atoms, were conducted at Bikini Atoll in 1946, but were quickly discontinued due to concerns over radiation. Next, Geiger counters are used to check the troops for signs of radioactivity. By 1954, however, advancements in technology had given rise to the fusion bomb, also known as a hydrogen or thermonuclear device, and testing returned once more to Bikini. This time, however, an initial success quickly gave way to the worst radiological disaster in US history. With a yield a thousand times greater than World War II's little boy, Castle Bravo vaporised the surrounding coral, leaving a crater 6,500 feet wide and 250 feet deep, whilst the pyrocumulus cloud stretched to almost 40 kilometres, punching through to the stratosphere. Due to a miscalculation at the design stage, Castle Bravo's total yield was three times that which was predicted. Subsequent radioactive fallout fell like snow over neighbouring atolls, ultimately spreading for over 7,000 square miles and kick-starting a later global effort to halt nuclear testing. The explosion's radioactive fallout is almost as dangerous as the blast itself. Hundreds of civilian and military personnel received high, sometimes fatal, radiation exposure. And for the Marshallese people, this still impacts day-to-day -day life. Cleanup operations on the islands began in 1977, almost 20 years after the contamination and involved the removal of radioactive soil, along with other wreckage, to a landfill in Runis Island. Coral, mixed with local sand, was used to form a concrete cap 18 inches thick over the high-level radioactive waste. Known as the Runit Dome, or more locally as the Tomb, it is a time capsule you never want to open. 
containing over 75,000 cubic meters of highly radioactive debris. The above ground structure acts as a sort of dam, holding back an invisible flood of radiation. Despite claims of its imminent collapse by some, the dome was found to be largely intact in a 2020 Department of Energy report to Congress. Unfortunately, the same cannot be assumed below ground, as no foundations were constructed, and one tropical storm too many could see the lowest levels submerged, the irradiated water spreading contamination throughout the nearby lagoons and reefs during its subsequent retreat. This highlights a key threat to the environment in the wake of a nuclear incident. With such lasting consequences, can there be any recovery? It would be pretty reasonable to assume that the marine ecosystems which bore the full force of Castle Bravo remain completely decimated to this day. Despite average radiation levels throughout the area having dropped to recognise safe levels, areas on both Bikini and Nian Islands exceed the maximum dosage by up to 300%. Were you to pay a visit to the mile-wide, dangerously radioactive crater at Ground Zero though, you would be met with an abundance of life. Instead of a nightmarish wasteland, there today exists a lagoon which has been described as more pristine than the those frequented by tourists. Almost 200 species of coral can be found thriving here, along with an abundance of fish, including several species of shark. On land, vegetation has slowly begun to re-establish, and Bikini has actually increased its avian biodiversity. Three of the 26 bird species which nest here have a place on the IUCN Red List, and actually flourish in the fallout zone, thanks to the area being deemed too dangerous for hunting. While we have yet to gain further insight from in-depth studies of the area, it is already clear that the Proving Grounds are an important area worthy of conservation, and a similar trend of adaptation and even biological resurgence has been documented in the zones surrounding Chernobyl and Fukushima disasters. More than half a century after its devastation, Bikini Atoll was proposed as a World Heritage Site in 2010. The seemingly counterintuitive observation of life adapting and even flourishing in the wake of such an unnatural event alludes to the fact that it may not be entirely unnatural after all. In 1956, the same year as the Marshall Islands were pulverised by 17 nuclear tests under Operation Red Wing, a scientist by the name of Paul Kuroda published his paper outlining the theoretical conditions under which a self-sustaining, natural fission reaction could occur in nature. Sixteen years later, his theory was confirmed with the discovery of no less than 17 ancient nuclear reactors across two sites in Central Africa. Known collectively as the Gabon reactors, these natural uranium deposits spontaneously began undergoing nuclear fission around two billion years ago. Groundwater would have acted as a moderator being heated to steam by the reaction until temperatures became too high, at which point the process would have ground to a halt until water could permeate the rock once more. This periodic on-off cycle is thought to have lasted for between 400,000 and 1 million years, with no evidence of the reaction ever having gone critical. Sadly, all but one of these fascinating sites have since been destroyed mined out for their uranium ore. The remaining example has yielded far more than fissionable material though. Studies of boreholes in the area indicate that harmful inert gases have been safely stored in the rock structure, offering a potential solution to long-term storage of nuclear waste from our modern power stations. While the Gabon reactors have furthered our understanding of nuclear fission, our sites are already set on a greater challenge, that of sustaining fusion. At the heart of stars such as our own Sun, intense gravitational forces cause hydrogen atoms to fuse together and produce helium, in turn emitting radiation which, from our vantage point just under 150 million kilometres away, 
we perceive as a pleasant warmth and light. Indeed, every stellar point of light in the night sky is a pristine example of a self-sustaining, clean source of energy, a tireless demonstration for our understanding, the application of which we have pursued now for half a century. Yet the nuclear fusion reactor remains a tantalising and elusive goal, with only a handful of working prototypes currently in existence. The two main variations are Stellarator and Tokamak designs, both of which rely on energy from superheated plasma heating water to steam, which in turn is used to drive conventional turbines. The proposed benefits over modern fission reactors are an abundant fuel source and negligible environmental impact, all the while producing four times the power of a modern fission reactor. Currently, the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor in France, claiming to be one of the most ambitious energy projects in the world, has been the main focus of attention. The first trial run is currently scheduled for 2025, and if successful, will be little short of a paradigm shift in energy production. Within the space of less than a century, we may witness nuclear fusion transition from a fear that divides nations to a hope that unites them. To close with them, an explanation of the title, A Metal Rose. We've drawn a comparison throughout the duration of this video between the effects of a nuclear reaction and the life cycle of a rose, and it is toward the end of the life cycle, not of a rose, but of our universe, that the metal rose finds its place. In the theoretical and unimaginably distant future of our universe, fusion takes place between progressively heavier elements, giving rise to an abundance of those which are particularly stable. One of the final states of the process we have explored today is the formation of celestial bodies the mass of our sun, comprised entirely of iron. The natural process that plays such a fundamental role in our existence here gives rise to monuments worthy of its importance. The rose which opened over Bikini Atoll is finally preserved as a testament of an inseparable symbiosis, the inevitability of the creation and annihilation of all things. A heart rate more thunderous than drums, a golden eagle the solar symbol, in the skies it's a movement of fearful symmetry.